Thank you so much. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, well, Chris Anitek and I will be the moderators for uh, today's panel. And before starting, uh, I would like to first do some introductions. Um, I have uh, Susan with me. Susan, can you go ahead and, and share a bit of yourself, a little bit of yourself? Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone who's here. Susanna Ambio, I'm from VMware. I'm the director of open source marketing and strategy, and I work with our OSPO to help uh, develop the organizational muscle around open source. I'm happy to be here. Thank, Thank you, Susanna. Uh, Sheila? Yes, hi everybody. My name is Sheila Saibi, and I work in the open source program office at Comcast. I've been in the OSPO for about five years and with the company for 11, and I reside in Silver Spring, Maryland. Happy to be here and nice to see everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, Nick? Yeah, thanks, Anna. Uh, my name is Nick Peters. Um, I'm leading the open source office at Porsche, basically being the head of uh, open source office at Porsche. Um, and um, thanks for having me. Thank you so much, uh, Alisa. Hi, everyone. Um, I am Alisa Wright. I um, help lead the open source program office um, in Bloomberg. Um, I'm based in New York City, and it's a pleasure to be here with you all tonight, today, this morning. As well, long as you have depends. a cup of coffee. Yes. <laughs> depends on the time zone. Uh, Chris? and I would be mute. Uh, hi everyone, Chris Anizic. Uh, have the you know fun job of being um, currently the CTO of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation and help run developer relations at the Linux Foundation. Uh, I've been involved in OSPOs for probably you know a little over you know 15 years now. I uh, helped run the OSPO at Twitter uh, back in the day. Help uh, co-found the To Do Group, uh, which is a home of kind of people that share OSPO best practices and amongst other things. Uh, really glad to be here and help moderate uh, this panel with with everyone. And uh, well, I'm Anna, a program manager at Tudor Group. Also, I've been involved in, in OSPOS and my previous role most in metrics at Viterja, so what development analytics firm, and now at Tudor Group, uh, helping organizations with open source program office education and best practices and uh, help people to work on common tooling uh, in, in that great community. Uh, so, saying that, I'm going to start sharing my screen to share with you the agenda of today. So, uh, okay, all right. So, this is going to be the agenda of today. As you can see, uh, it's a set of uh, questions that we will be uh, asking for all, this, all, all the panelists for today. But before with that, um, we would like to give a short introduction of what OSPOS are, because there might be people here that are just starting to learn this uh, concept for the first time, and also share the short story of Tutu Group. And then we will go through all these questions, and once all these questions are answered, it, that will be your turn. We will leave some Q&A space for people to actually ask to all these seasoned OSPOs uh, everything you would like to ask about the NOSPO and how a NOSPO is created and specific issues you might have and you might face. So um, let's start with the, the first introduction. That is what actually an OSPO is. So simply as think about an OSPO as this centralized place where all the open source efforts are happening within our organization. So when you are thinking about uh, how to implement policies and processes and ensuring legal compliance and how to host, how to um, host open source projects, how to contribute upstream to open source projects all the different activities that are so diverse across uh, the organization and all these open source efforts are in a single place. And they put a strategy on top of that to have aligned goals. And this can usually helps to accelerate this open source adoption. Um, Chris, do you want to go to the next slide? 
Oh, you clicked it. So you're clicking. Go ahead. Uh, did I? I think I clicked. Oh, got it. Sorry. Yeah. See it now. Okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No. I, you know. It, you know. Ospos have you know been around for I think you know thirty years. Uh, you know, as a way for organizations to tackle, uh, you know, open source consumption and 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 production, and you know, it, you know, what kind of historically started out as kind of a you know a technical comp, you know, tech company, internet company thing has basically broadened to all different industries, from you know, financial to automotive to uh, academic uh, and so on, because people are seeing the value of you know, taking advantage of open source software to improve uh, innovation within, um, you know, organizations and the, the duty group has been at the forefront of kind of helping bring these ideas uh, to uh, to organizations, um, you know, we've done a lot of research in the organization uh, from kind of uh, how OSPOs form and develop. Uh, it tends to be very different for companies. You know, it, it truly depends on what type of, you know, what the company is doing with open source. Some people are just simply consumers. Some people actually ship code on phones, devices, cars, and so on. So you're going to have kind of different, um, you know, attitudes. But generally, what you know happens is, for in the beginning. Almost everyone is using open source software. They may not even know about it, uh, but they're using it uh, for sure. Uh, most products these days uh, ship it. Uh, a lot of people don't have full uh, awareness. Um, you know, within the Tudor Group, we've kind of put together, you know, this research and kind of stages of how companies evolve through their, uh, you know, uh, you know, OSPO uh, journey. Um, you know, like I said, generally, you know, default status quo is starting with adoption. Uh, a lot of people after that focus on essentially uh, open source uh, inventory, uh, ensuring legal compliance, educating developers within the organization of how to properly consume and produce open source software based on company policies. Uh, after that, generally, the next stage is, um, you know, essentially uh, advocating uh, for the further use of open source within the organization, also participating in upstream, um, you know, communities out there to ensure that they have the ability to influence open source projects for their, uh, you know, benefit. Um, after that, you know, there's a little bit more essentially uh, deeper engagement. Companies start to produce uh, code and share uh, projects, maybe on their own GitHub organization or GitLab organizations. And then finally, um, you know, kind of the final stage is, you know, companies are, you know, full blown leaders, you know, either starting open source foundations, movement technologies that truly shapes uh, the industry. And so this is kind of a, a, a model that we've kind of come up, um, you know, for for people to kind of think about their, their OSPO journey in, in, in an organization. Yeah. yeah, and as, as Chris was saying, like OSPOS have been evolving. It's not just software companies, now it's everywhere in every industry. And uh, we see like OSPOS are becoming a more complex term. And for instance, we have in an OSPO, we might find different roles. Uh, some of the roles might be focused on security, on licensing, others in community engagement, others in uh, project management and governance. Uh, we also have different responsibilities depending on the OSPO, uh, like maybe um, collaborate with open source organizations, develop and execute an open source strategy, uh, implement inner source practices to then move to open source, that is another one, um, give advice on open source, uh, grow and retain open source talent inside the organization, and so on. Um, so as you can see, everything is really diverse and it's uh, something that we cannot put together in, in, in a single uh, place and say, yeah, this is an OSPO. Uh, so that is why to the group is, is for. Uh, it's uh, an organization, uh, an open community of practitioners and organizations that aims to create and share knowledge and create, collaborate on best practices and tools to create effective open source program offices adapted to uh, different needs. Uh, depending on the industry, depending on the region, and so on. And uh, we've been here for a long time, but now uh, we it's formed by more than uh, 1,600 community participants and more than 70 general members. Uh, you can see that it was founded a long time ago, but we have been evolving a lot. And uh, just also short story to, in case you would like to learn more about to the group and uh, join the community. Uh, there are our communication channels. We will share the slides uh, in the chat soon. And some interesting resources 
you might like to take a look. We have networking and communicate networking spaces, communication channels, also spaces for contributors to help us work on to-do guides and white papers on studies. So um, the door is open and feel free to jump. Okay, so um, I'm gonna come back to this agenda that we have. Um, I think I, I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna uh, stop sharing because I think it's better because people can actually see our faces. Uh, but just to let you know that now we will move to the to the questions that I share in in the initial slide. All right. So, so the first question it's a common one. <laughs> um, how does an organization start its its OSPO journey? I know who would like to to start and break the ice. Okay, uh, Sula. Sure, thank you. Um, so I can tell you a little bit about the Comcast um, OSPO and how our journey started. I think I mentioned earlier that I've been with Comcast for a little over a decade. So open source actually predates my time with the company. Um, but we started our OSPO in 2017 and we went on a hunt to figure out if we could find when open source started popping up here at Comcast. Um, after interviewing a lot of folks across the company who had been here much longer than we had, we actually were able to trace it back to uh, 2006, where we knew we were consuming open source. 2012 is where an open source advisory council was formed, and I see this happen across other companies too, where they don't necessarily have an OSPO, but they have dedicated folks who spend a certain amount of time on open source. Um, for us, that was in 2012, and that included our legal team. Uh, several engineers across Comcast um, representing security, networking, architecture. Um, and today that actual that Open Source Advisory Council still exists and members of the Open Source Program Office are now running it. Um, so our, our OSPO actually opened in 2017 and we've been around for roughly five years. Um, and we started with just the contribution guidelines that were in place by the Open Source Advisory Council and we started working our way up from there. Cool. Um, does anyone would like to share their experience on the journey? So I'll jump in there. Um, thanks for telling your story, Sheila. That's very interesting. Uh, Comcast's journey is similar to, to my story. I've been at VMware for 12 years, uh, doing a variety of roles, but I started working in open source about six years ago. And six years ago is when our former CEO, Pat Gelsinger, uh, declared uh, that he, he wanted VMware to be among the best in open source. And he made a strategic choice to invest in that because it was important to not only our customers, but also to the company as well. And so with that declaration, there was uh, a focused effort and intent and a strategy to develop an OSPO. And that's when Dirk Hondel joined the company. He's now moved on to another role uh, in the industry, but that's where the, the sort of the nexus and the gravity started around doing open source with strategic intent rather than opportunistically. And I think, I think that's where an OSPO can really help an organization. Most organizations today are consuming and using open source somewhere. They just don't know it. And they may be doing it accidentally or incidentally. And as soon as you pivot towards, oh, this is a strategy. This is part of our supply chain. This is the third leg in our IT strategy. You buy software, you build software, and you consume, use, and contribute to open source. And once you step into that strategic mindset, that's where an OSPO can really make a difference and actually help you turn that wheel even faster because you've got someone, that's their role. They're paying attention to it. And they're helping the organization shift their mindset as well. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to, I hope I didn't interrupt anyone, but yeah, I'd like to um, uh, plus, plus 100 that. Um, uh, so I have been at Bloomberg um, at the ASPO team for the past year. Uh, but prior to that, um, with the kind of tutelage of Kevin Fleming, um, we started an ASPO team 
uh, 10 years ago. And I, and I think it is exactly um, that transition between, um, and not just being um, incidental or accidental that you're using open source because you know fundamentally we all are, but that really bringing it together into a strategic, um, a strategic mindset to, to not only bring in processes that make it easier for us to engage in the open source communities that we're a part of to sustain them um, and to be you know uh, good good you know, citizens but but also you know there's a there's a plethora of other like kind of pieces of, of what it means to be a, a you know to do open source in a strategic way so um, we have had the opportunity to, to be um, at Bloomberg, we have the opportunity to have been part of um, the technology strategy for the past 10 years. Um, and, and, you know, look forward to like grow, growing that as we become, you know, more and more aware of our, like our, of where open source fits into our so it's supply chain. Thanks, Alyssa. I'm just going to add um, something to that. So we at Porsche, I mean, Porsche is not really a traditional software company. We are car manufacturer, basically. But as Chris mentioned previously, um, everyone utilizes open source and we have so many applications that completely consist 100% of open source software. And we do have two streams, basically, enterprise applications. So then we're talking about mobile apps, web application and embedded software. And uh, we always had, I wouldn't say an OSPO, but kind of OSPO processes. But two years ago, we officially launched our open source office, initially really focusing on legal compliance. And we had always legal compliance and such things, but more kind of a decentralized approach. So we started really establishing legal compliance and focusing on security and now really trying to give back something to the communities um, because contributions also count um, and this is what we're trying to do um, so for us it's also kind of a holistic approach we are not just focusing on consuming open source but we, we really want to go the the whole way thank you so much for for all your answers um, as you can see it's quite different depending on the organizations you ask right um chris do you want to i would say but uh, yeah but i would yeah. say that there there is one really important common theme for, for me when i hear people's stories um or organizational stories and that is the the step between um just uh back to um back to suzanne's words like incidentally accidentally using open source to really strategically deciding to like, how are you going to work with um, open source, whether you're a consumer contributor um, and having a, a little bit more mindfulness um, around like your, your, your engagement with o open source. So I yeah. think that that is like, um, that is the, uh, I'm thinking of cartoons, but that's like the, the, the canyon to be jumped. Um, and yeah. once you're there, yeah i will i will say like there is like a phrase that can uh summarize this that is from open source ad hoc to uh thinking strategically and about open mm -hmm. source so that right. would be like the common like the key the missing key that maybe some organizations uh will need to think about that right right and then as soon as we get there like and then there are many ways that it might look like in an organization has to and has to be responsive to what a organization looks like already but like that first like like step of agreement ne needs to be there like you know we're not just doing this we are doing this for a reason and once a once the organization comes to the realization that they need to adopt a strategic posture around open source then the next step is you, you kind of have to look at your organization to see you know who you are and what's happening where because not every part of your organization is going to be ready for certain aspects of, of open source strategy some are going to be more immature some are going to be more mature on that scale so you really have to be agile and and, and adapt to each organization's sort of place in this understanding 
um, some are just consumers and they're just consuming. It's like, okay, that's fine. But do you know why you're just consuming and what you're just consuming and what you need to do to change that consumption from ad hoc to strategic, right? And, and that's where an OSPO can provide that mentorship, that consulting, that introspective look at, hmm, this is interesting what you're doing here. Let's have a chat about how you can take that to the next level so that you are you know, making informed choices rather than accidental ones. Uh, it's 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 just interesting to see how things have evolved over the years because you know early stage ospos were generally formed based on someone making a mistake someone maybe shipping some gpl code in a router they weren't supposed to or you know leaking some keys somewhere and, and now it seems to be at least I, those are different days where open source was maybe less adopted but now it, it's just so incredibly pervasive across uh you know a, a company companies, you know, software in house that you have to have kind of some strategic thought of what you're both consuming and producing, because the downside is, you know, if you're using all this open source software, most likely you're going to find bots, security issues, and so on. And you may have to do fixes on your own. If your organization makes this impossible, you are just adding a lot more work to your internal teams of managing forks and dealing with that process. So it's just kind of interesting to see how things have, have, have shifted over the years. And I think, you know, the next, the next question here, um, you know, that Anna put together is, you know, it, you know, be kind of curious if, you know, what, what kind of, you know, barriers your organizations have faced when, you know, essentially uh, establishing and growing um, you know, your, your OSPO and maybe any other regional challenges, because, you know, I've seen some companies struggle with, uh, resource and staffing, sometimes justifying that, hey, we need some more people. Um, and, and you know, the, the way I kind of see the OSPO movement is it, it's similar to what happened, you know, maybe 20, 30 years ago with the security, uh, you know, uh, and kind of CISO movement. Companies back in the day generally didn't really have security team, you know, it's uh, until security issues, uh, you know, happen. And I kind of see the same thing happening now. Uh, with ospos that you know they're just becoming more pre prevalent and no one questions the need for a security or CISO team that's just literally cost of doing uh business right now so i'd kind of love to hear from folks of like kind of what challenges um you have faced and kind of growing and establishing um uh, your ospo so, so i'll so jump Suzanne's in got... yeah i'll jump in and go first um i think one of the biggest challenges that vmware faced in our ospo journey is um that many people, VMware is a big company. So we're 40,000 people, you know, I don't know how many people are engineers slash developers, but many people who under, think they understand open source and are, are used to it, come into VMware and, and bristle at some of the process because they're used to being an individual freestyling, I'll say on GitHub. And once you're part of a larger organization, that freestyle, you, you have to adapt it to working within an enterprise because your great idea that you want to push out into open source community may in fact overlap with, intersect with a product roadmap that you are unaware of. And so the OSPO provides that sort of centralized process point of view so that everybody can look at that and, and again, make those informed choices that are based on a strategy rather than an individual desire. And that really, we ran into a lot of grit there because there's a lot of creative people and they, you know, this is what they're super enthusiastic and energetic. And we're like, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's have a chat. And, and we, we hit a lot of grit there to, for people to understand and accept that there's a larger strategy around open source. Anyone other, anyone else want to chime in on, on, on challenges? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would I want to see this as a potential counterpoint. And in, in terms of one of the challenges that I've seen is that there, there are a lot of processes in many of the organizations that we're talking about. And so how do you um, uh, inject an open source like considerations into the those flows um, and and it's not just one um, process it's all of them 
because open source touches everything. And so I, I find one of the challenges um, both about this, um, this topic of work is that it touches every, you may be in one office, but it really touches every single department. Um, and so the breadth of um, the breadth of competence one must have as a team um, it can't be held by an, a single individual. Like it needs also, they're almost similar to an open source project itself. Like I think need to be a matrix of experts that come together um, and, um, and and talk about how open source will be strategically, you know, uh, kind of implemented within the within the company. And so, so, so a challenge for me that I see within the Bloomberg is injecting open source into like all the like existing processes um, um, and and requirements things that are coming from in our internal processes and like legacy of being around for 40 years um, from the you know legal laws of, of, of being in the financial services. But like, how do we inject the lessons of what we have learned of, about open source um, and the strengths of open source into like pre-existing structures of, of, of how business is being done? Yes, so, so I absolutely agree with Alyssa. Um, so from a posture standpoint, basically, uh, yes, we do have lots of processes and open source basically touches lots of departments and processes, for example, patent. And then you have to make sure that it's basically lean um, and you don't disturb the product teams when, when we're really talking about legal compliance on the one hand, but on the other hand, you also want to enable product teams to contribute. And now lessons learned, so for example, so we as a uh, open source program office, yes, we are the competence center, but we had some issues to actually to reach the product teams. Everyone is aware of our processes. Everyone knows they can reach out. We are having best practices. We are trying to teach them. We are having e-learning, but still we had issues. And then what did we do as a next stage? We basically uh, set up a concept of coordinators. So we went to, different product teams and departments mm -hmm. and we try to establish the so-called coordinators who kind of a bridge of the OSPO and these coordinators they are working with us partially but also with the product teams so they're kind of really the bridge between the product teams and the open source uh, program office and that was a breakthrough for, for us at Porsche because now really things are much more smoother uh, one coordinator, for example, if he works with a product team of 60, 70 developers, I mean, he's really our bridge and he can really translate our message. He can enable people and he's also developing by himself. So that was for us kind of a lessons learned, um, establishing a cross-functional team, establishing coordinators, and you need to have all skill sets. So our we're calling ourselves like we have the open source program office and then we have the next stage it's the open source management team um, legal legal folks uh, technical people functional people um, and that's a success for us so you have to have all kind of skill set within your open source program office or at least within the open source management team um, to have also the breakthrough and also to move on and to help the product teams Yeah, totally, totally. Bridge, bridge coordinator is definitely required, especially for large <laughs> organizations. So one more question before I hand it, uh, you know, maybe back to Anna to ask some other questions. So, uh, <laughs> you know, OSPO structures tend to vary a lot across organizations. When I helped start the OSPO at Twitter, basically, I, I would say it started in what would be called the office of the CTO before it shifted a little bit to the security team briefly. Uh, and then another reorg happened, then it was developer uh, efficiency or developer programs where, where it ended up to be the most logical place. I, I'd love to kind of hear you know, from, from all y'all where your kind of OSPO is, is structured, which part of the organization, you know, it, it may live in, because I've, you know, I've seen OSPOs live in legal and security, it, you know, truly kind of depends where, where, you know, where that organization is and kind of what it does for, as a business in terms of generally where, where an OSPO uh, sits, but would love to kind of hear from, from all y'all uh, where, where, where your OSPO currently is or where it has moved, if it, if, if, even if it's moved around, that would be interesting to know. 
Sure, I, I can jump into that uh, for that one. Um, so when we, uh, when our, our OSPO first started, it was being led by Nithya Ruff, who is no longer with us. Um, but originally when, when the doors of the OSPO opened, we were uh, in the security org. And that's when I joined. I joined, I think a month or two in um, after the OSPO had, had opened up. And then we actually got moved to the office of the CTO. So um, that's where we are placed now. We are right um, in the office of the CIO slash CTO. Um, and, and it's part of the developer strategy uh, organization. And that's kind of a new um, name that we have uh, under this org, but we stayed, we're still under the office of the CTO. I'm, I hadn't heard of uh, OSPOs being under legal. That's really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Probably bad times. So, so that's up. <laughs> Go ahead, Susanna. Yeah, so for VMware, we've always been, uh, the OSPO has always been in the office of the CTO, um, but it is a matrix organization. Uh, I don't report to the OSPO, but I am hardlined, matrixed into them. I actually sit in our global marketing organization, in our brand team. And so it's surprising to a lot of people, but it's with intent because it's, it's again, going back to the, sort of that ambassador guild concept. We're trying to infuse the organization with an understanding and appreciation for open source. So me residing outside our OSPO formally and our legal team also hardlining to OSPO, but sitting in legal enables us to really diffuse that expertise into various orgs using the language of that org. So I sit in brand, so I understand their language, but I hardline into OSPO, so I understand their language. So I can kind of translate and bring it over into the organization. We can start to infuse the rest of the org with an understanding and appreciation for open source and why it's so critical to the company. The legal team does that, security team does that. We have these ambassadors that we seed in different organizations uh, to help grow this muscle and make it stronger. And, and to ask a follow-up question there, Suzanne, like these ambassadors, that, that is their full-time role Steve. it's informal it's informal it's not a formal title that i that i anoint you with but we have identified individuals who are uh, savvy with open source understand how it works how it should works understands our processes and are able to be a point of contact within their org and answer the questions locally and then if things aren't addressed there appropriately, then they can then can get escalated or routed back to the OSPO. Because the OSPO is a small organization and, our, and VMware is 40,000. So there's no way we can answer questions for all 40,000. We have to distribute that knowledge. Yeah, we and, also and have an ambassador program um, at Comcast. Sorry, Alyssa, go ahead. I was just gonna jump in and say, we have a similar program all over the country, all over the world. Uh, we have folks in India, we have folks in uh, all over the US. They're passionate about open source. We get manager permission from them. We say, hey, can we borrow four to six hours of their time each quarter? And we don't really bother them with much, um, but we ask that they help us uh, triage. We, we ask that they tell us who's doing open source. If you know of teams that are doing open source that haven't talked to us, Let's meet them, um, and they've been super helpful. It is exactly uh, what you were saying, Suzanne. It's so hard to scale across thousands of engineers with a small but mighty team. So the ambassador program has been super helpful with that. And and I was just going to say, and perhaps like I, I feel like the question um, uh, betrays the, the interest. I, I feel like um, the 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 structure of an OSPO team is not static. Um, it is constantly mm -hmm. changing both with like the, um, the technologies that um, we're bringing in, how the ecosystems are changing, you know, and, and, a, and a reflection of the expertise like that, uh, that the company um, kind of demonstrates in-house. And so we, we ourselves like the OSPO sits in the CTO office where a lot of like our um, sort of um, forward thinking, like develop, like um, R and D work happens. But you know, to everybody else's point, like of having you know tentacles in you know all, all the different departments, um, we have like a matrix, not of ambassadors, like in that word, but um, 
um, but of guild leaders and, and what we call an open source council. And so they help us um, answer questions, specifically procedural questions about how to um, uh, either open source a project or contribute to an upstream project. Like these are what these are places where the expert, the legal expertise, the um, uh, language expertise, like is not just cannot be held by like you know the few people in the ASPO team, but really we like defer to the expertise that happens and you know and exists throughout the company. Um, but it's constantly moving. Not it has it hasn't moved from the CTO, but I'm just saying like it's the I think the structure of an ASPO of an effective ASPO team is not static. Um, it, it needs to be resonant and reflective of what's happening um, in the world like and in the, the languages um, and projects that we're supposed to be, you know, working with and, and, and being part of. Uh, I don't know if Susan wanted to add anything. I, I think you raise your hand and then you, you you're okay? Okay. Yeah, so uh, we have a few times, so let's uh, move to the next question. Uh, I think it's it's, Kind, kind of related, like what you said about uh, first, uh, once the OSPO start, it evolves. And I imagine that the goals of the OSPO would, at the very beginning start are evolving over the time. So I wanted to ask, um, what were the main goals of the OSPO at the beginning? And if those goals have been evolving, and if you find a reason why why those uh, were evolving for your specific organizations. I mean, I can start. Um, so basically, yeah, at the beginning, we wanted to make sure that we have a central competence center that focuses on um, compliance. That was the first stage. Then obviously adding security uh, than uh, contribution. And basically, as I've mentioned previously, so we are not a traditional software company. We are car manufacturer, uh, but software is everywhere. And now uh, everyone knows it. I don't have to explain about uh, cars and that um, software will basically lead the way. Uh, but we are also evolving together with our organization. So for example, we do have, or we have founded several subsidiaries like Porsche Digital that are just focusing on development and they just consist of software developers and so now our goal is right stage three is really also enabling the teams and showing the way how to contribute and what we are basically doing as the OSPO so we as an OSPO we, we actually are very we are just a technical team we consist of um, 10 12 developers um, plus we have legals and, and coordinators uh, I think ambassadors is a better way really to call them uh, this is what I need to take with me. Uh, but but the, the, the point is the following. We, we also want to lead by example. Uh, so like when we uh, do the uh, security process or when we want to make sure um, that we are compliant, uh, we are actually developing the tooling ourselves together with other industry partners. So really, and that's an open source project, like open source review toolkit. Uh, because we want to show also the product teams that we as an open source office, we're not just utilizing commercial tooling, but we're collaborating together with the communities. So for example, with Bosch, with Fiat Technologies, BMW, and so on. And so we can lead by example, because we are not just talking, yeah, we're enabling you, here are the processes, we are no best, but we're actually doing it by, our, by ourselves, actually writing the code. Um, and, and that's also the difference, uh, I think, because then, the developers trust you immediately um, and they can just have a look on GitHub and see the product uh, where the OSPO is basically contributing to it. Uh, Susan? Yeah, and then that's, that's a great example of leading by example. Um, our OSPO uh, operates in the same way. And I think the evolution of our OSPO we started at compliance. I think everybody starts there um, and then, then matures from there. So I would say ours kind of goes, went down to the four C's. Compliance was where we started, contribution, creation, and community. So as we got an understanding and grips on compliance, okay, now we understand what we're consuming and that we are compliant. Now let's start 
going up? How do we contribute back? How do we go upstream? What's the best process for doing that? Okay, now that we've learned that skill, organizationally, we moved on to creation. So what if we want to do, create new open source, all right? That's a different skill set. And then building community around that. All of those things, you know, sort of start to exercise that maturity muscle. And our OSPO also tries to lead by example, showing people how to do it well and right. A good example of that from VMware is TURN, which is uh, it's, it's a tooling for inspecting containers and creating your SBOM out of containers in the SPX, SPDX files that was donated from VMware to the Automated Compliance Tooling Initiative. And that is an example of us building the tool, um, being compliant, contributing, creating, building a community, and really stepping up into a larger, more, uh, uh, you know, uh, neutral organization under the LF. So that's an example of VM, VMware's OSPO leading the way. Uh, so again, the maturity model for us is compliance, contribution, creation, community. That, that's how I would view it myself internally. So. And, and by the way, Suzanne, I, I like the example with TURN because TURN is on our roadmap. We're actually going to evaluate this. And um, um, we also thinking actually contributing back to turn. So that's on our roadmap. So that's funny to know that's coming from you, uh, basically from VMware. Wonderful. I can, I, connect, I can connect you with Rose Judge. She's the lead maintainer, if, you, if you'd oh, like. Oh, that would be great. That Wonderful. would be great. Um, I'm just going to add in plus one um, to everything that Nick and Suzanne said. So we're all, we're also the same. We started with the same exact um, needs. And I was just going to highlight one step before that. One of our goals was actually to get our name out there and also learn about the open source landscape at Comcast. We knew it was happening. We know we're consuming. We know that we're, there are people contributing back. But like I said, thousands of engineers, thousands of teams, how do we know what's strategic, what's even tied to the business? Um, so that was actually one of our first goals was to learn about the landscape and figure out what kind of open source was happening and then tie it together with the OSPO and start building our community from there. So that was kind of one of the big uh, things we did in the first year that we existed was get our name out there. and one of the new goals I, I don't know if you mentioned um like how that has evolved i'd say um based on that that map that chris showed us the maturity model i think we're moving towards the right direction um we uh, one of the latest things we launched is a required open source training for any and all technologists that work at comcast whether you're brand new or you've been there for a long time. Um, it'll just pop up, everybody gets notifications. And from there, we talk about consumption, compliance, contribution, um, usage, how to contribute back. Um, and so that, those are kind of like, we're, try, we're getting to the point where we're influencing, influencing and making decisions at a leadership level. Um, and hopefully we can continue doing that. Okay, uh, I just have to say that we are uh, a bit um, 50 minutes uh, from uh, right now from uh, the schedule uh, time. So we're gonna move to, Q to Q and A now because we have four questions right now. And uh, so I'm gonna start uh, sharing with you. And if you want to, anyone wants to answer, just raise a hand and, and jump in. So the first question is, you talk a bit about the value added to OSPOS at the very beginning. Uh, how do you quantify the value to upper management or non-technical folks? Anyone that would like to jump in? I, I th I'll jump in. Um, I think this is a, a an ongoing and really uh, deep question. Um, there was an ospology that I like uh, would reference back to um, about like not measuring return on impact and return on investment, but rather measuring impact. Like what what is the impact of having an, an OSPO team? Um, and I, I for for me um, for me looking at um, the number of of teams that are able to contribute to open source and the speed at which we can make that happen, the number of, um, and, make, and making it measurable is important. So those numbers are important. Um, 
uh, the number of projects that we've been able to open source in successful ways, not just like turn on the switch and say, hi, we're open source now, but really like, you know, um, uh, kind of um, build a foundation for community. That's the way that we measure impact. Um, the our presence at open source um, related events um, and our leadership and voices there. Um, that's the way that we measure impact. Um, and then finally, and I think that this is you know part of probably um, I think all of our pieces is is hiring, hiring and retention. Um, this is like you know open source is a an important way to develop technology um, to innovate on technology, but it's also, I think, a very um, uh, satisfying way to do that as well. And, and so I, I, one of the ways that I measure my success is like, you know, how, how many um, open source contributors and leaders are we bringing in uh, to um, Bloomberg that are finding their homes there, they're able to continue to do their, their work um, in their open source spaces. Um, and 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 so HR um, and you know related like kind of communications around that are, are is another way that we measure impact of our work too. And there's more, but I will I cede the floor. Yeah, just uh, I'm just gonna add one sentence to this, um, and it's challenging. Um, so really, to convince upper management or top management why we should invest further in open source and to contribution. But um, so again, we, we're trying to lead by example. Uh, so meaning we as OSFO, we completely built everything, the whole tool chain and everything that we have is based on open source technology. We contribute back. And I have a couple of slides and use cases where I'm basically showing the management, look, we are leading by example and driving some comparisons. This is the comparison if we, for example, would have acquired a commercial tooling versus what we are actually doing. We have, for example, cost saving. We are collaborating with other partners such as Bosch or here technologies. We learn from each other. We share our backlogs, so really telling them by example how we do it and that we actually drive innovation, shorter time to market, uh, cost savings and trying to kind of tr translate this also to other product teams, uh, but it's challenging. It's not always easy, but this is at least my approach. Uh, I'm trying on a daily basis. And I'll, I'll jump in with a with a different angle on measuring the, the value and the contribution of an OSPO to the organization. I really look at it from a qualitative point of view, not a quantitative one. So I'm looking at the, the impact on brand, on reputation, on perception, especially in our customer base, because VMware is a software builder. We sell software. That's what we do. That's how we make our revenue. And more and more, we see our customers anticipating, expecting, open source as part of the solution we bring to them. So if customers are expecting it, they're expecting you to be a leader. They're expecting you to be a role model. They're expecting you to be in those communities that matter to them. So I look at it more from that reputational point of view than I do from an engineering angle. And I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's another aspect or dimension of an OSPO and, um, and your relative maturity in it. Um, reputation change may not be something you, you value at the outset, but as you mature, it becomes an attribute you take a look at and you watch. But I think what's key here amongst all of us is that it's important to kind of track why we're here, you know, like what, what, what we're doing. I mean, and that we're showing value. Uh, so it's, it's um, there's a lot to, to, to do reactively in the job just to keep like the um, things flowing, but this is a, a really important part of, of the work as well as like carving out time to be able to show that like there's, a, there's an important reason why we're here too. 
Absolutely, Elisa. Um, uh, next, I'm going to move to next question. We are getting a lot right now. So the next one is, how is the training on open source software compliance been happening? And who are the typical candidate for it? And how frequent is the training given to that person? So I can jump in really quickly. Um, open source training is given to all new hires. It is a requirement. They learn about compliance. They learn about the processes. Um, so that is done within the first, I think, three weeks or four weeks of their new hire training. Um, and then it's part of our ongoing uh, engineering essentials learning modules that all of our technical people have to complete. And so then one question, is it kind of an e-learning thing or um, are you really having kind of uh, people who are teaching this? It, it is e-learning because we're such a distributed global company okay. um, to have it face-to-face -face is challenging, especially, I don't know, the last two years, pandemic. Yeah, that's it. Um, prior to the pandemic, we had local in-person trainings face-to-face but it is all transitioned to e-learning at this point. Okay. Yeah. So, so basically just to quickly answer this question, same at Porsche. Um, so we do have e-learning and it's mandatory uh, for everyone who at least has some touch points with IT products. Um, so no matter if it's a developer or a product owner um, and they have to do this. Um, we're going to move to the next question. Uh, thank you so much for the answers. Um, how is the security program uh, carried on? Uh, just a vulnerability, uh, sorry about that, just a vulnerability check or full scale? Um, I, don't, I didn't get the first one, but let's, let's go to how is the security program carried? Or if uh, the person that answered this, that asked this question is here, uh, that person can turn on the mic and, and explain better this this uh, question. Okay, so let's just answer how is the security program carried on in your organization? Um, I can jump in. Uh, we partner very closely with our security team. So we actually have a member of our security team that is part of our open source advisory council. So they weigh in on all code that goes out to open source. Um, we also recently set up a standing meeting with our security team because we want to make sure that um, we keep a strong relationship with them and that we are also conveying what we're doing in the open source space with them and that we are um, just maintaining that relationship and keeping in ties with them. So we're they're one of our stakeholders and also one of our very close partners. I'm just okay. going to add to this. Um, so, so what we're basically doing is, is, is sim similar what Sheila just explained, except, and that's a new approach, that we as OSPO actually want now to own the FOSS security piece. So we are now really building the capabilities and the people because we are saying we need to have a holistic approach. Um, so we're going to be the FOSS security team as well. And we're kind of restructuring it a little bit. Okay, uh, another question. Uh, what are some strategies to open up proprietary code bases in your organization? If you can, I mean, you don't have to answer, uh, but if someone would like to, uh, or cool, sir, anything, if not, we can move to the next one. I, I can jump in from a, mm -hmm. from a general point of view, is that what I have learned in my past six years look, looking at open source versus proprietary, the proprietary code was written with that in mind. And it wasn't written with a, an open uh, community contribution point of view. And so proprietary code is really never ready to open source. You sort of have to start with open source as your end point. It's very difficult to take something that's proprietary and take it apart and get it ready to be open source. You just can't go, you just can't flip a switch. 
Um, so it, it, that is a very difficult thing to do. And you would have to really work with your business leaders to understand why you think this switch from proprietary code base to open source needs to happen, what needs to happen to get there and, and you know, really ask those hard questions because that is a very difficult thing to undertake. Chris, I don't know, do you have any thoughts on that? It, it, it's gonna depend on kind of the organization, what they value, patents, IP, like, like it, it's, I think it's a mix of everything. I do think if you have a proprietary code base that's been around for a long time, untangling everything to open source that bit is, is very difficult. This is kind of why you hear a lot of companies these days going a, a quote unquote like default to open approach where it means like you know you you build this as you potentially may intend to open source it um, uh, you know later as a successful approach but it, it's it, it, it it's it's hard you know every, every company kind of goes through it's you know what truly is uh, you know IP for us how how do we you know make money is is this stuff actually something that we should open up or, or not so I think it just it's it's completely um, you know, a variable. But yeah, I started so to quote a list in the chat, starting with an open source mind will make your life significantly easier to eventually open source that code down the line. Or even, even if you don't, generally starting with open source mind will bring better collaborative practices. Uh, you'll probably modularize your code base uh, a little bit better uh, and, and so on. So there's just a lot of benefits outside of just purely being able to open things. Yeah, dependencies are always uh, uh, a, a nightmare. <laughs> so. Uh, I want to be sensitive about that, time. But, go ahead, go ahead, Alyssa. But you know, but but if there is this like like this gem uh, of something yep. that you really want to open source, I mean, I I uh, an organization, I, I feel like you know, don't don't give don't give up, but but try to find the the people first, the projects first, where that might yep. fit in. You know, like so, um, but um, but. <laughs> Starting, starting with an open source like in mind, in mind at the beginning, I, I think is really where we want to like build from. Yeah, and I think when if you're planning on doing that or, or considering that, really have a three year minimum time horizon in mind. Too many people open source things with a lot three of years. energy, <laughs> and then like six months later, they're like, yeah, oh well. Like, no, once you do this, you've got to be committed to it. Because if you build a community around it and they start embedding it, if you walk yeah. away, that's the ultimate betrayal. So yeah. know that it's not a short-term commitment once you open source something. This is something you have to really promise to support and be yeah. active in. Yeah. Um, sorry to interrupt, but we are already out of time. Uh, there was all the questions. I tried to put them together because we have, an, in Tutor Group, we have an OSPO forum where people ask questions and the community and other OSPOers uh, answer them asynchronously. So I would really recommend to go to the OSPO forum and ask questions because uh, there are other people who uh, share best practices and, and, their, and their point of view. So yeah. Uh, Chris, I think you wanted to mention something. No, no I, I put the links for all your uh, the OSPO discussions. We have an amazing Slack community, but you know, please use more of our uh, public GitHub resources so things are you know indexed and you know we kind of collaborate a little bit more on uh, systems that are indexed by Google and other search engines versus being lost in Slack. Yeah, and all I have to say again, um, thank you so much, Sitan, uh, Sila. Chris, Nick, Alisa, and everyone here that has been attending, asking questions. And I'm really sorry that uh, we didn't have time to answer all of them. But as I said, uh, our doors are open and the community, so feel free to join and, 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 and engage with other sports. Cool. Thanks and all. saying this. Um, <laughs> Eventually. <laughs> bye bye. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> bye bye. Bye. <laughs> Have a great right, day. Bye. Right, take care, everyone. Bye. Have a nice day. Bye bye. Thank you so much to our panelists for your time today, and thank you everyone for joining us. Just a quick reminder that this recording will be up on the Linux Foundation YouTube page later today. We hope you join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day.